There are very few photographers that can claim to be one of the original Canon Explorers of Light, even fewer that can claim to have shot multiple Time magazine covers, and I didn't even know that they gave out photography awards at the United Nations, but apparently somebody's gotten it more than once. Today, it's Jack Resnicki, as we head to Indonesia on this episode of Behind the Shot. <laughs> Hi again, welcome to another episode of Behind the Shot. I'm your host, Steve Brazel. This is the podcast where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots from conception to completion, all the challenges, stories, and questions that happen in between. And as always, if you like the podcast, please head by iTunes, leave us a review. It's always appreciated. And of course, you can always reach out to me if you want to. The easiest place is probably Twitter. It's Raz2, R-A-Z-Z2 on Twitter. I try to answer everything, and I usually try to answer it too quick because I never sleep. Uh, so with that in mind, our guest today is somebody that's been on the podcast before. Um, he, in fact, was on just the last episode, but he was on a kind of a special episode. We weren't talking about one of his photographs. In the last episode that he was on, we talked about copyright for photographers. I realized through some things that I was going through how important that is in photography from a behind-the-shot point of view. But as we were discussing the episode... I looked at him and I went, you know, you're one of the original Canon Explorers of Light. I need to get you on with one of your photos. And today is that day. Jack Resnicki, welcome to Behind the Shot. How are you doing? Very good, Steve. Happy to be here. It's so nice for you to join me. I appreciate you're making time out of your New York schedule. Um, <laughs> you've been introduced on the show before when we did the episode with you and Ed Greenberg, uh, which I'm going to touch on a little bit more here in a second. But let me just kind of set up. They can always watch that episode for the full detail info on you, but... A quick setup. You're New York based, obviously. Yes. Um, you are a commercial people and children photographer. Correct. So you work for, you have corporate clients. Can you give me an example of some of your corporate clients? Oh, I've had uh, Toys R Us for well over 20 years. Um, uh, I've done ads for most of the major ad um, uh, companies here in New York, um, L'Oreal, um, Crest, uh, uh, Sony. Uh, I, I did one of the original... Uh, Mavica brochures when the oh, really? selling Mavica first came out. Okay, and then you've um, also done Wall Street Journal. Uh, I think you said Crest, but AT and T, Hyatt, yeah. Kodak. You get around. Um, you also are an educator. Mm -hmm. You have lectures. You have workshops. And at the end of this episode, I will give information, or Ed, uh, not Ed, uh, Jack will give information on on the workshops that he does. Uh, you're also a Photoshop at World instructor, Photoshop Dream Team instructor. How long have you been doing Photoshop World, World with Scott Kelby? Wow, quite a while. Um, uh, I couldn't even tell you. It's been over a dozen uh, okay. of those. Okay, and I started to mention Ed Greenberg because you are both a partner and a co-author of a book I have in front of me. Oh, and I forgot. I have a post-it note <laughs> on the <laughs> section unusual. on registering your copyright. Uh, it is the Copyright Zone, a legal guide for photographers and artists in the digital age. And yes, I bought this copy. It's that good. It's it's one of the best photography books, and it doesn't even talk about photography in that sense. So uh, amazing. Um, you've been on This Week in Photo with Frederick Van Johnson. Right. Um, you've had several Time Magazine covers. Uh, and as I say, you're a published author. This was the one that really struck me, though. And I mentioned this on the last episode, too, but I got to hit it again. Two times you've received something called the IPC, which is the International Photographic Council Leadership Medal. It's called Excellence in Studio Photography. And you got it at the United Nations. Yeah, which for me was very easy because it's about three blocks from my apartment. So it's, it was a neighborhood gig, so to speak. Um, the first time I got it, I was nominated by Kodak, uh, back when Kodak was uh, um, a well-known company. And the second time was from uh, PPA, Professional Photographers America. Um, I sat on that board for 10 years and was the president and the chairman of the board uh, at various times. Of PPA. Okay. I mentioned earlier, one of the original Canon Explorers of Light, Yep. but also Epson Stylus Pro, SanDisk Photomaster, and X-Rite Colorado. So you've got a lot of credentials behind you. Yeah, and I, I did some consulting for Leaf way back when in the original um, medium format uh, backs. Okay, but obviously, I, as a Canon Explorer of Light, like my buddy Rick Salmon, you're you're a Canon shooter. What oh, what body absolutely. do you shoot mostly? I'm sorry. 
What body do you mostly shoot? Um, these days, between two, depending on what I'm doing. Um, the uh, 1DX Mark II, which I absolutely love, and the 5D uh, Mark IV. And I want to find the guy who names these cameras and beat them to a pulp. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. It's, totally it's, agree. It's the worst. But those two cameras, I, I like a big camera in my hand. Um, I'm 6'2", and I like the feel, you know, after all these years of a big, heavy camera. And that's usually my go-to camera. But if I'm trying to travel light and I'm going around or um, various situations, I like the 5D. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm a 5D4 shooter and a 5D3 shooter, uh, mostly because I don't like the battery grip size. But So let's get into your shot a little bit here. Okay, doke. The photograph that we're going to we're going to talk about really struck me when I first saw it for a reason I want to mention before I bring the photo up. The the photo that we're going to talk about is so rich in color. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's just the nature of the location that you were. I, I don't know what it is. But first of all, just give me kind of a, a summary as I pull the shot up of where was this shot and why were you there shooting this this particular image? Oh, it's a good question. Um, uh, this was done. I was hired by the um, Indonesia Ministry of Tourism uh, to go photograph around uh, different islands in Indonesia, but not Bali um, itself because everybody went to Bali. They wanted to get other areas. So they took us to a lot of small villages. It was it was just wonderful. Um, uh, and, uh, the color was there. I, it's the color is something that I talk about a lot in my lectures, um, that certain colors and color combinations attract me, um, uh, just like a shiny object to a monkey. I mean, I see it, I'm going to go to it. Uh, I saw this wall because of the blue and the yellow, the, the um, opposite colors, which is always right. something that uh, vibrates and is something that does pop out in photographs. Um, then I saw the girl in the blue dress, and uh, I shot the wall all by itself. I have some nice pictures of just uh, pretty much framed like this without the kids. Um, and then I saw the girl in the blue dress, and I asked our fixer, the, the person who spoke the local language, if – if she would go against the wall so I could get a picture of her in the blue dress against the yellow wall uh, specifically. and Which she would was, have been nice because you've got the blue frame around the windows on kind of a large rule of third, and then her in the blue would have been great alone. Right, um, which I, I really liked. And uh, there's a lot of shots that I, I took there, and if you go to my website, you can see a lot of Indonesia shots. Uh, it was a fantastic place for a photographer to photograph. Um and a lot of things were caught moments. Um, it's not often I'll do a setup like this, but I'll, I'll do whatever I need to to get a good shot. And I thought, oh, the blue against the yellow is really going to look great. And she was just way, way too shy. Um, and, and we don't push anything. You know, she didn't want to do it. That's absolutely fine. Um, so then what I did is the little boys in there, especially the one who's laughing, looking up, um, was very outgoing and was very curious. So I started taking pictures of him and I placed him in other areas, not against this wall and, uh, took various pictures with him. We had a, um, Canon speed light and I did some stuff available light, some things with speed lights, um, and a little tiny, uh, portable soft box, um, which is real easy to take on these types of, um, uh, endeavors. Uh, let me, like let me ask it. you about that. Because one of the questions I was going to ask was about the lighting because, and by the way, first of all, the, the, the young boy that's, that's laughing and looking a different direction than the other three, right? you know, is, is you've seen this in portraits, you know, for years and years and years, that adds contrast in and of itself. You have three band members looking forward, but the lead singer is blurry and looking a different way, you know, whatever. Yeah, that's, um, that's what that we call to me gesture. Adds Say again? That's what we call gesture in a photograph. And and that's a term that I stole from my friend Jay Maisel, who uh, who coined it. And um, uh, it really explains it's that little something, that little humanism, that little uh, spark in a picture that, that gives it some soul. And it's just a gesture. And a gesture could be uh, somebody doing something. A gesture could be an inanimate object, too. But uh, in this case, obviously, I shot more than one picture because I'm a photographer. You know, right, our, right, right. our famous last words is just one more. 
Um, but the reason that this was the one that I, I used was specifically that because of him looking up uh, at. So, that. do you know was this all natural light or did this use the speed light and softbox? No, this was all natural light. I know that. Okay, because I one of the things I noticed, this is one of my weird little quirks that I do, is I always look for shadows. Mm -hmm. um, you know, indicator of how they lit it. Did they add extra light? Whatever the case might be. There are no, that I was able to find, shadows that tell the tale of what lighting you used here or where the sun was coming from. Look under their chins. And and I was looking at noses, but look under their chin. You can see the soft light. It's, it's yeah. an overcast Yeah, so is the, is the sun almost, is this like noon? Um, it, it's the middle of the day. So yeah, I'm going to guess that it probably was midday sometime. Um, and not a sunny day necessarily. Um, there was some okay. overcast. So when you're shooting a shot like this, uh, you got your Canon camera. Any idea what lens you might've been using here? Oh yeah. My, my, what I call my desert Island lens, my walk around lens, which is the 24 to 105. Um, and the this was F4, the, um, which was my go-to lens on concerts even for years. Yeah. It's. It's a, it's a, a, I call it my desert island lens. If, if you were stuck on a desert island and only had one lens, which lens would you use? Um, and that's my desert island lens, which I stole from the uh, King Biscuit Flower Hour when they used to talk about uh, desert island albums. Um, you know, you just aged yourself. <laughs> and the scary thing is I knew the reference. <laughs> so that's not a bad thing. Um, but anyway, when you're shooting, I, go ahead. I, I just wanted to get back to the shot on, on how we put it together. So I photographed that one boy and then his friend who was a little shy, the other boy came in. Um, and then, and then showing them the back of the camera and what I'm getting and they laughed and, and this, and then the girls came over and wanted to see what I was getting. And so once I did that, then I asked the fixer again, could you get them to stand against the wall? And so after, after spending some time with them and interacting with them and showing them what I was doing, um, then um, that broke through and that's how I was able to get them against the wall. So you actually, I, I'm trying to search for the word trust is the thought that's coming into my head, but but you built trust with them to where they felt like they could go up there and, and literally pose. A absolutely. Interesting. Interesting. So how much of, but, but any communication you did had to go through the fixer. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Remember, I, <laughs> you know, 25 years or so of shooting with Toys R Us, I've done a lot of shoots with kids. So um, you don't have to speak the language. You just have to, I, I tell people the, the best, photo equipment you can have with you what piece of equipment really really helps you going on these things and and that's a smile um it's your attitude and the way you approach things and and not be pushy and um your demeanor your demeanor and a smile and you can get a lot of things done i mean it's it's a very friendly country people were really really nice and uh it wasn't hard to start interacting with the kids so so let me ask you this i'm guessing in this scenario, you're walking around outdoors. It was probably auto white balance. Yeah. In this case, it is. Um, if I'm in a fixed lighting situation, I absolutely will fix my camera to a, a, a Kelvin or one of the presets so that a whole series, if the lighting's the same, is the same lighting throughout. Um, auto white balance, I'll use where I don't know what's going on or what we're going to face or what's going on. Uh, it's also a good solution. The problem in a fixed light situation is if if I'm doing something like this and suddenly the girl in blue walks out or the kid in red walks out or walks in, it changes the white balance because it's based on, on uh, the camera trying to um, align all three channels the best it can. So if something changes, it'll change the white balance slightly. Okay. Um, but in a case like this, yeah, auto white balance. Single, single point. Uh Single shot focus, I'm guessing. In this one, it, it was single point focus, but these days, honestly, I'm going into um, the nine point where um, it'll it'll focus on on my point. But if I'm hitting something that doesn't have enough contrast, which is how the autofocus works uh, on these cameras, um, it'll search for the closest. A box near that. So you're not doing a on. zone. You're doing the one on Canon. I know this because of the 5D4 has it where you right. choose a point, but then you have focus assist points around it. 
Right. The, the, there's one that'll have four assist points and there's one that'll have nine. I go right to the nine on these types of things. Now, if I'm in the studio and things are very controlled, then I'm going to go with single point. Okay. And what about metering on this? Would this have been evaluative? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, evaluative is, is, uh, Knowing the, the metering system very well in the camera, um, to me is smart metering. It's, it's, it's taking in a lot of consideration and it saved me on a couple shots sometimes when it's been heavily backlit and, uh, I suddenly got into a situation, um, which happened in Africa once where I, I like to walk around, um, on these types of situations sometimes where the sun might be going in and out or I'm going indoors and outdoors, um, uh, and especially if I'm shooting in a traveling vehicle, which I love to shoot from, um, you know, drive by shootings, because you can really get slices of life that way sometimes. I set my camera to auto ISO. And it's one of the things that I talk to in my workshops quite a bit that a lot of people don't use. And I think it's one of the best features in, uh, in your camera these days. It, I can fix my shutter and my aperture to exactly what I want. So if I'm walking around uh, doing something, um, I, I'm going to probably start at 750th of a second at F8 all over. And I'm just going to let the ISO float because I don't care how high the ISO goes. If I don't have a sharp image, I'm not going to use it. Um, so I, I might go to a thousandth of a second or 1500th of a second if we're in a car um, walking around 750 uh F8 is about what I usually go and let the ISO float. Um, and uh, to me, that's a smart camera. The um, evaluative metering is smart metering. And, and the story I was getting to is I was in Africa shooting outdoors with, in a Maasai village, got a great shot that's actually the, the um, lead shot on my website. And then they took us into this little hut that was a schoolroom. And I didn't look to change my settings. I walked in and boom, there it was. Took a quick shot. That turned out to be the shot of that session inside. Uh, and I looked at my camera and without readjusting everything, it was at 26,000 ISO and still held up really good. And the evaluative metering saw that it was a backlit situation and, and took that into account and saved my exposure. Um, interesting. Really interesting. So, um, I'm curious, there, there, was, there was another thing that was interesting to me on this shot that was a design choice, you know, of you, the photographer, and the editor. And that is the fact that this shot is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I tried to do the math on it. Uh, it's an 8 by 10 crop. Okay. And I'm, I'm curious, what, what obviously the camera wasn't shot at 8 by 10. What, did you make the choice to crop it the way you did because there was extraneous information outside of the crop? Or was it just that you felt it was a better composition choice enforcing those rule of thirds by cropping it? Great question. Um, uh, I, I crop to death sometimes. Um, and I probably crop this just because of the composition, of the tightness of it. Um, wasn't thinking rule of thirds or anything like that. I, I really go... Um, with my eye and, and I lecture a lot about different compositions, about triangles, about, um, rule of thirds, um, um, uh, and all sorts of different compositional tricks. Composition to me, um, is when I'm shooting, it's, uh, it's done by instinct. Um, I, I've been shooting, I don't want to tell you for how many years, but since I was 13 years old and, um, uh, it's an instinct thing for me. Composition, when I'm thinking about it, is uh, post-mortem. It's done during the editing process. And I've had shots where I've, I've just worked at and worked at and recropped and recropped until I get the composition that works. And then I notice it fits into one of the, quote, rules. Um, but shooting, uh, I, I don't sit there and saying, oh, this will look really good if I make this rule of thirds. I do it instinctively. Um, like if I'm shooting something and the foreground is interesting – the horizon line, I'm going to try and get into the thirds. And usually a horizon line you want in the lower third because that anchors the picture. But sometimes if the foreground's interesting, I'm going to raise it up instinctively to the upper third. Um, and uh, the one shot that I talked about in Africa that I absolutely love um, on the front page of my website 
the horizon line's in the dead middle, which technically you don't want to do. Um, but, you know, all the rules are meant to be broken. It's I really go by the visual. Well, and you just said all the rules are meant to be broken. And that's one of the things I tell people when I when I do presentations, and that is it's fine to break the rules as long as you know them first. Absolutely. So you have to understand that they exist for a reason and they've existed for long beyond your life. The rule of thirds, the, the you know, dead center is deadly type thing. Um, but art is also art. Right. And, and if you create your art in the box of those rules, that's not creativity. But, but the cropping thing is interesting to me in that you didn't think about it, but you ended up cropping it until you, you got the energy, basically, is the way I look at it, that you wanted out of this shot. But cropping is post. And I mentioned at the very start of this, the bright colors. And so I kind of want to finish this image on the post end, wherein when you're dealing with those kind of colors, you could oversaturate an image very, very quickly. In fact, for that matter, depending on the lighting, your, your sensor could clip on certain color channels. I'm assuming one that you shoot raw, but two, what did you do to this shot other than cropping in post? Not much. I mean, shooting raw means that you're getting raw information, so you have to process it, and you have to add in a contrast curve of some kind. And you do do shoot raw? I absolutely shoot raw. Okay. It's um, um, so much more information and gives you so much more control over your images. Um, uh, probably didn't do a heck of a lot on this one. Um, uh, without knowing exactly, I'll tell you, it's it's some type of contrast is always added because raw files are flat. They're meant to be. It's a straight line. And, and you should add some type of contrast. Um, the other thing is I tend to open up the shadows a lot. Um, I'm looking at reproduction here, and it looks like their hair and and the uh, D-Max, the shadows, are a little dark. Um, but I, I generally open up the shadows with um, – uh, the shadow slider. I think it's, it's, you know, just brilliant. Um, and you, you do it in Lightroom? Uh, mostly in Lightroom these days, but I'll also go into Photoshop um, okay. and work. Uh, would you have boosted naturally, just instinctively, your vibrance or your saturation on this? Or is this probably straight? This is pretty close to straight. The, the, the saturation, no, I wouldn't have touched. I might have hit vibrance on this one. Um, uh, I'm looking at, at the red. In fact, I think one of the issues with this was the red, the little boy all the way on the right, where if I boosted it too much um, uh, when I'm making the print, um, it blows it out and, and it goes out of gamut. Um, right. So uh, if I did anything else in here, um, because this was a very colorful place, um, I might go into just the red channel and pull the saturation a little bit in the red. Did you, to your knowledge, did you dodge or burn, or do you normally, would you dodge or burn or vignette, a slight vignette, any oh, of these I love, I love to do slight vignettes. Um, I don't think I did on this one. I might have. doesn't look like it unless it's one of those ones like a, there's a couple of people I know online that do it. Matt Kluskowski does just literally, you know, minus five, and, and it's, it's not visible, but it's visible when it's not there, you know? Yeah, it, it's... You really don't want to notice it, but putting in a slight vignette rounds out the picture and keeps your eyes into the center where you want people to look. It's, um, you know, our eyes, and I do this on my lectures a lot, our eyes go from dark areas to light areas. And I show just adding a subtle vignette, how it, it just keeps you in the picture and really changes the picture. But yeah, if somebody can sit there and say, oh, that's a vignette, you've gone too far. And, yeah. and the one I like, and, and we're going to probably lose when, when I'm going to lose when the Mac uh, OS High Sierra comes in, uh, is the Nick software. Their light and center darkened edges, I think, is just uh, uh, one, of, one of the best features in Nick. Well, and, and one of my favorite plugins is the Nick uh, Color Effects Pro, the, the Pro Contrast. Um, I love the Pro Contrast plugin for yeah. the type of photography that I do. And the fact that Google just announced that they're not going to update it is heartbreaking to me. But, you know, oh, it's just terrible. And, and High Sierra is going to 64-bit, um, and they're going to eliminate a lot of 32-bit. And, and uh, while Nick is still working for me quite well, um, I think that's going to go to the wayside. It very well could, yeah. yeah. yeah I'm but, looking forward to High Sierra. And for those that don't know, it's a Mac operating system like you have Windows 10. It's We have Mac Sierra now. It's going going to High Sierra. So, Jack, but, 
Um, I, I have a, uh, by the way, I have an, an old tower that I'm hanging on to just for that reason. What, a Mac tower? A Mac Pro? Yeah, I have an the old, old cheese grater I, Mac. I'm sorry? The old cheese grater style Mac? Cheese grater? I never heard that one. Yeah. You know, the big silver box that looks like a cheese grater on the front. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I have one of those that I'm hanging on to just you know, with, with uh, older versions of Photoshop, just so I can use the, uh, the plugins. Smart move. Good reason to have it. So, so we mentioned earlier that you do workshops and I, yes. I know that they're on your website, but just give a quick synopsis, if you would, of the workshops that you do. I don't do that many. Um, uh, this year, the only one I'm doing is a portrait workshop in um, Silo City, Buffalo, which will probably be over by the time you broadcast this. Um, but the only other one I have coming up is going to be a small group uh, going to Myanmar, um, formerly Burma, in December 2018. And any of the information's on my website. They can find you know dates, everything there. Absolutely. There's there's a, a little icon they can they can click. It'll take you to the the page that explains what we're going to do day by day. And and if you go to thisweekinphoto.com, find the Behind the Shot podcast. The shortcut that I created is just behindtheshot.tv. Uh, if you go there, find this episode. The blog post will have all of all of uh, Jack's links as well. Uh, Jack, to find you online as people want to look you up, obviously the copyrightzone.com is your project with Ed Greenberg, the, the attorney from New York. Yeah. And the book is available on Amazon. I'll have that link online. But also, what's your normal website for your photography? Um, if you can spell my last name, it's just that, which is uh, Resnicki.com, which is R-E-Z-N-I-C-K-I. Um, I love the fact you closed your eyes and had to think about the spelling. <laughs> so no, everybody puts in an S. You know, it's like they want to do R-E-S, but it's R-E-Z-N-I-C-K-I. Okay. And then on uh, Twitter, you are Copyright Jack. Right. Uh, on Facebook, Jack Resnicki, and on Instagram, where I follow you on Instagram and Twitter, actually, uh, it's just, again, it's just Resnicki. So people can find you really easy. But again, just go to thisweekinphoto.com, find the Behind the Shot podcast. I'll have all the links on the page there for you. You can just click them. It makes it really, really easy. But I do suggest follow him on Twitter, follow him on Instagram, because literally one of the best photographers that there is around and watching his feed come through, you will learn just by watching what what he puts online. So You're again, make me Jack, blush. thank you. <laughs> wait a minute. Yeah, actually, you are a little bit. Uh, again, I can't say thank you enough for your coming on because this is your second episode. We did the one with Ed on copyright that was over an hour on copyright information. You, have, oh, didn't, you didn't see like it. that episode. You got to see it. Yeah, it didn't feel like an hour. It really zoomed. Yeah, it, but it's such good information. So again, taking your time out again today. I really appreciate it. And uh, for everybody else, make sure you subscribe to the podcast, either in iTunes, the Google Play Store. That's the easiest way for you to make sure you never miss an episode. And again, drop us an iTunes review if you would. Always appreciate them. Just be honest, whatever it might be. My name is Steve Brazel. I'm your host. This is another episode of Behind the Shot, where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind the shot. Mm -hmm.